Hello, everyone. My name is Alexa Desjardins, and I'm the Recruitment Specialist at the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape. Welcome to our Faculty Information Night. Thank you so much for coming and joining us this evening. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this session is being recorded. We would like to acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Bikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. By the signing of Treaty 7 in 1877, the university recognizes that we are all treaty people. This evening, we will share some exciting information about our SAPL programs and the academic journey to becoming a design professional. Following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period until our program ends. If you have a question throughout the presentation, you can put it in the chat and then we'll answer those during the Q&A. So to get us started, I would like to introduce Professor Catherine Hamill, our Associate Dean Architecture. And Catherine, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your slides. Hi, hello everyone. I can't, um, let me go there. Can you see them? Yes. Okay. You so aren't in, so sorry, Catherine, but you aren't in presentation mode though. Yeah, no, I need to see the ones on the side to move through. Okay, this great. This is a PDF, so. Okay, I can't really see who I'm talking. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for your attention for a few minutes. I thought uh, today we'll take you, as uh, Alexa said, take you through a bit through the profession and uh, the program we offer and what the opportunities are after um, for some of our students that study. Um, all the slides that I'm showing are student work from our faculty, so that's also a way to showcase the range of what we do. Um, one of the biggest things when we start talking with a, with a profession is a lot of people assume, like I'm talking about architecture, of course, is uh, assume buildings are designed by ar architects, all, all buildings, but actually a lot of them are not. Are not. So, one of the first questions for me is often asking what students is, what do architects do? Um, as a profession, it has an amazing range from imagining new worlds to all the way to building them in a, in a very practical way, or at least as a lot of us dream building one of those buildings. So we're put forward as uh, if you look at what architecture architects do is they design constructions, um, projects, they alter existing buildings or uh, redevelopments. Um, and that's one of the areas we specialize, of course, in buildings, but there's a lot more in terms of the range. And what I think is very exciting is the, is the, practice, is the way we practice to think about things. Because we often talk about um, architects use their drawing skills uh, because we we're always working with things we imagine and seldom with things that actually exist outside our imagination. And it is a team sport. Um, there's the idea outside that uh, we all dream or uh, I think it's an idea that's passing and Alana is here. I think we'll applaud that in terms of uh, you know, the grand architect uh, being the master and the uh, genius that design, does everything, but it's actually, it's a huge team behind every building uh, that puts the work together. But uh, beyond designing buildings that are functional, safe, um, sustainable, pleasing, there's also the space between the walls that has impact on the people who move through them to make them feel safe, sometimes unfortunately designed to exclude certain people, to help them if their bodies uh, need help to navigate in different ways that we assume is normal. And the impact occurs at many different levels. So in the way both we acknowledge and er erase uh, some of the conditions in our society. So that's where it's a complex uh, thing when you start looking, uh, thinking about it. And that's where the range occurs because it, one person doesn't do everything and we come together as teams thinking through these things from 
the design, the impact, what needs to be considered to the technology to, to actually building it all the way through. So the design is a way to consider things. And if you're a good designer um, to add value to things. So ultimately, I think the architect as to why we would hire an architect to hire to build something is the process of adding value, or at least that's what we like to think. And starting to think of what value gets added or how the different schools have different directions and where the different training occurs. Um, because architecture and design have impact and have um, responsibility to, as we shape the world that a lot of people inhabit. And so it's not, uh, not designing things just as, um, as making things beautiful, which is often, I think, a misunderstanding. This project is actually one uh, being developed now in one of the studios. I'll come back and talk a bit more about it. So as a profession, uh, it is legislated, which means we are we're, there's a professional body that comes that reviews the school. We are one of 12 uh, accredited schools and there's the Canadian Architecture Certification Board that comes and tells us we're doing a good job or if not tells us where we have to improve. And that's really important if somebody wants to become an architect to go through an accredited school. Um, there is a curriculum that's structured, a part of it, a foundational one, but what's fun also is there's a lot of room to offer different classes where students get to develop the areas they're interested in and our program definitely follows that. So what I'm gonna follow with is a lot of fun images, I hope, that you find them fun that showcase our students as they're working um, some of the projects they've either drawn or built. It's um, as a school, what's also nice, I mean, anybody from an art background or uh, design knows that is the, the pedagogy, the way we teach is very much studio based. It's uh, call it experiential learning these days where you don't sit back in the room and listen to a professor talk a lot in the front. You're actually given guidelines, uh, projects each year through what's uh, the studio and other courses that uh, support it. We have a fantastic workshop. So it's a lot of thinking through making uh, and learning through making and uh, different projects at different scales. And so the, this is, uh, you know, as, as you look through, um, some actually are design build projects that go into public space. Some are in our own building. And there's a lot of discussion and showcasing the work. So you get feedback from different people until you develop a direction that you really believe in. And I think that's, that's very important rather than coming in, getting a formula, doing what um, is, you know, this is architecture and then, and then uh, moving, moving forward. So as a start, this idea of thinking through making, drawing, we do have students, this, this is first year students in a graphic course going through right now, where you start thinking about how, what to design, how to design, how to use the different tools. Uh, with digital tools these days, we have, it's uh, the romantic idea of the architect drafting with, on, a, on a blueprint is gone. I, I don't even know if the young generation knows that as a reference, but if you Google architect, you still get a lot of, um, you know, the triangle and the compass and a, and a paper as if, and the architect drawing, but we actually use a lot of digital media like the Adobe Suites, uh, Rhino, Grasshopper, Revit. So those are things people uh, learn as some come in uh, to programs with it, but, uh, that's one of the big parts of the learning and then doing a lot of exercises where um, you, know, you, you start exploring how to represent what the tools are, different ways to interject in the environment. Um, we do a lot of models also looking at um, fabrication, whether we start by hand, but some digital fabrication and then thinking of how architects um, you know, as a, we talk about orthographic drawings, which are the way architects think still, but uh, it's changing with, uh, with the, the digital modeling is we actually design by cutting buildings up. And one of the first exercises we do is we actually get students to cut up peppers and start imagining inhabiting those spaces and then move forward. 
they also get to work with geometry and different forms, different shapes, and come up with imaginary scenarios of different buildings. These are also first year projects that students are working on in terms of how to make um, a narrative, a story of a building you're imagining and how you see it inhabiting a context and how people move around it. Um, we do a lot of model building. We have fantastic uh, 3D printers and 3D printing, of course, these days is moving in a way where um, housing, refugee housing, different forms are starting to take shape. And that's an exciting area that uh, in, the, in the field. But this is a first year model where it's more plexiglass being bent to represent what was a pavilion and then playing around with the way it affects lights and again working with photography. But that also becomes as we move as, you, as students move through the uh, program, it gets to become first it's more exploratory to learn the tools, but then it becomes combined with uh, more practical and realistic projects and building prototypes, more full-scale prototypes. And uh, these are examples of uh, one of our professor, Alicia Namit Vasquez, where they're working on the, the outside skin of buildings and energy uh, uh, consideration and uh, how to save energy. And we have a few professors in the building science where that's their area of specialization, also people with building materials, but these are, fun examples where they're working with wood, bending wood, doing the prototypes digitally and then building full scale models. So those are some of the students in the lab building those. So definitely one of the things I would say getting one's hand, hands dirty and exploring um, through making rather than just sitting back and imagining is a big part of design education. When you come out, there are different roles and some people like to write about it uh, and reflect or give guidelines and they can probably become more academic in, in that sense. But as I, uh, there is quite a broad spectrum in terms of the activities. This is another one from that same uh, project where it's a full scale prototype. So sometimes you work and you're just doing your own little project, imagining things, building it at a very small scale. But we also then start to zoom in and uh, build things at larger scales and then thinking more and more and more details and all the different implications, not just of the building on society, but the building within itself with the materials, the cost of construction, who will build it. And that's where there are so many different ways to, to get into the examples. So that, that's an example of students having fun. There's a fabrication lab where they were just playing around with how to cast concrete and fabric. And there's some beautiful examples in real life of uh, concrete, not just being you know, some of the flat surfaces we tend to see around, but uh, different shapes and uh, different colors. And there's some fantastic things happening these days with materials, trying again with energy efficiency. We have a student who graduated a while back and um, did the digital, more of a high tech uh, masters in Barcelona and now works at the school, but she does a lot of uh, firing and uh, paste 3D printing and is the, her research and her work currently is looking at glazes for pottery that actually absorb uh, CO2 carbon. So there's a lot of very interesting things happening at different scales. This one is a course with, with Guy Gardner where students work with um, bricks and brick laying and then robotics, seeing how you can code a, a robot, program it so that it lays different, uh, different forms, different walls, different combinations. And then students started exploring different ways of casting the brick. So I think the last, the next one is an example of some of these walls that you start to see going around the world in terms of a facade of a building, a wall, not just being a flat surface. So it is an exciting time um, and, a, and a responsible time because there's a lot of uh, buildings are horrible in terms of energy and climate. And there's a lot for the profession to respond to um, in our capacity, which is not small, but also there's a lot of fantastic stuff with the, with the profession, with the new tools, with the programming where things are definitely not at a standstill. 
So we have quite a range in terms of our faculty. We have uh, of our in-house faculty. Sometimes we do have fun and get along. Uh, we each have different areas of specialization. Some uh, are, you know, uh, are more design uh, fabricators and build. And if you're in Calgary, which I'm assuming, I don't know on Zoom, we never know where people are from, but this is next to our CBDL downtown building where Mauricio Sotorubi, our structures teacher with students uh, built uh, this bus station. We have some that write and quite a range of different things. Some that specialize more like in, in health and aging and different, uh, different considerations. So in addition to our own faculty, we have a great range of people we hire within our school from outside. And one thing like this year was uh, pretty amazing is with the shift going on Zoom and we use Miro where students can see each other's work. We've had some fantastic range where even being in Calgary, you have people teaching different courses from across the world. So, and I think that will continue regardless of whether we are back fully in person, because there's an advantage whether it's for reviews when at the end of the year we have, we showcase the work and get feedback that way. So we do run a number of courses where people also fly in and, uh, uh, and within their area of specialty, um, enrich the student's education experience. So again, these are just some examples of some of the work. Um, we have a studio also where um, in the third year before students graduating, at least that's in our own program, students work with a practice with a, in the industry. So they get some training rather than just work in school and then go and find work. And in architecture, you do need to be, to call yourself uh, legally an architect, you do need to get registered. Usually there's an education, then you do an internship under the mentorship of somebody who is registered, then you apply and pass an exam. And only then can you call yourself legally an architect. As I said, there's some really um, the foundational courses, but also some fun things. And these are examples of some stud student project. This is one that I find is quite wonderful is uh, it was a Métis student who was working in his final research studio on looking at plastic, repurposing plastic, but uh, also looking at indig indigenous sensibility. And so he actually built all these pallets, uh, these little plastic bricks in his own kitchen and built, fabricated this little hut. Of course, there's a much richer story, but in the time I have, um, I, I just think it's, it's worth and uh, people are interested in high things there and the so we do have a whole range from and others go way to more in the urban scale. Uh, in can you see me? My internet is not. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, you're more? freezing a little bit. I think you're back. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> so this is a project just where things go. Uh, again, I think what's really exciting in, uh, in this day and age and with design, um, on top of the responsibility, because the status quo as was is no longer acceptable, the new technology is providing some fantastic opportunities that we can take advantage of. This is a fun one where, again, Alicia was working where you have uh, an app where people, the way we interpret the city, it was done at our CB, uh, at the lab downtown where people through the app can engage and create something, interpret, direct the robot that then through coding interprets the building or the area they're locating in the city and rebuilds it. So it's more than just a bunch of fun images that we do because that's what starts to make people think of what are we paying attention to, what needs to be designed, how it needs to be done or changed or not, even what's the quality of light, the heating. So th that's, that's why it can start as a, hey, look, it's a fun narrative, but there's a lot that we learn from these things. 3D print printing, these are examples 
We often, students have exhibits that we showcase the work as we're exploring different things. And then at the other scale, this is Alberto Di Salvatierra's work where he has a big a civic commons lab where they're working and mostly run by a lot of, with a lot of students from landscape planning and architecture and bus the business school. So it is interdisciplinary where they're looking at all the empty spaces and empty buildings in the city, in Calgary, this one in particular, and how it, they can be re revitalized so that to help both the economy and the need and the, the social needs in the city. We have uh, Alana with us where there are certain groups and I hope keep growing where, uh, especially last year where they started a very strong group called Advocates for Equitable Design Education. So students directing, and reinforcing the things they want to learn and uh, feel the need for the profession to be going is a big thing that a change that is happening now in the last couple of years and hopefully will keep moving. With that, um, with, with Zoom, but also some of the block weeks where we can bring people. This is a fantastic exam example. Maya Bird Murphy is a, the Chicago mobile makers, very young woman who started this uh, mobile design where she goes around educating students, young people um, about some of the potential of the design, but also the problems and the way we lack of consideration has impact on people, especially under mind people in our society. So design can, as I keep saying, is not just the aesthetic side, but there's a lot of social and political implications and responsibility at, at all the different scales. So we do that by also inter engaging, whether it's panel discussions or speakers. So there's a lot of different ways to get all the, the, the information and then start translating it in your own projects as you go through school and afterwards. So as a, as a Last is looking potential fields of action. Some of the people, um, there's a range. We have people who work in the city and uh, are the chief urban designer is David Dan, who's in Calgary, who's from our alumni. There are people who start work in offices. Some of our students and alumni start their own offices. There are quite a few practices. Design education can also, uh, the, the thinking some, um, it's can, well, sometimes arrogantly, but we go into the furniture design. We have students who are more in a, at the industrial design scale. So there are a lot of different things when you do a design, especially architecture education, it's not necessarily, I have to go out and design buildings. And we do, you can see um, again, uh, through whether it's working at the city at different scales, we have uh, alumni in the social housing component. We have people in the, Urban Alliance and one of the projects this year uh, with working with students is designed winter city competitions. And there are people like Kate Thompson, who's an alumni who's uh, behind the, the, the well, had a big uh, voice and involvement in the downtown library. So there's a lot of different directions that are quite um, challenging and interesting. And it, it, is, a, it is a profession that uh, takes a bit of time to settle in, but it is also extremely exciting. It takes a very um, malleable mind um, and working with other people um, to, to, to actually go through it. And that does start at the, at the level of education. So I think with that, um, I'm at my time, um, is one of our mottos, I think it's fantastic, is we can design a better world. There's a lot to be done. And uh, that not being in a, in a problematic way, but a lot of things to pay attention to. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. Now I would like to invite Alana Kerr to share a bit about her experience as a sample student. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, let me get this shared. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to share a little bit about both the architecture minor at U of C as well as the master's and my experience in each program. Uh, so just a bit of background for me. Um, I did all of my university education at U of C. Um, I did a Bachelor of Fine Arts for my undergrad in Visual Studies, and I also did the 
architecture minor during my third year of my undergrad. And then I did the master's immediately afterwards. Um, I'm now a registered intern architect at a company here called Perkins and Will. So I sort of structured this presentation as a bunch of questions that I found myself asking as I worked through this process and also wish I had asked. So hopefully this will be helpful for anyone in either high school or undergrad looking into um, doing any of the programs that Apple has to offer. So first, why did I choose to become an architect? I honestly don't really know where it started from. I wanted to be an architect since I was in like grade three, um, but I think it, it started from, I always loved art and design and that sort of naturally progressed into houses and then progressed much further than that. I find it a lot easier to answer this question now having gone through the program because I know what it's actually about. Um, but I think what Catherine ended off in in her presentation about how much impact architects can have and how diverse the field is, is really what continues to draw me into it as I you know, work through the steps of becoming an architect. So um, I'd say the diversity of the field is what I find most fascinating and what I think so many people are drawn to because there's really endless possibilities of what you can do with an education in architecture. So in saying that, how do you decide which undergrad to do? Um, I decided to do art because it was what was most interesting to me. And whenever um, people have asked me this question before, like, you know, is there one that's most useful or one that's best to do? I would argue there is not. Um, I think the best one you can do is the one that you'll enjoy the most. Um, you're gonna spend at least six years in school. You might as well enjoy it. So, and you can really apply any undergrad to the program. Um, I've listed some of the most common ones that I know my classmates did, um, but I'd say, yeah, choose, you know, have a think about what you want to bring into your architectural practice or what you're most interested in now. And that's a really good starting point because you can really apply anything to the program. And why should you do the minor? So I wanted to do the minor because, you know, I chose to do art as a starting point for architecture. Architecture was always my end goal. Um, so it's, it's a great way for you to sort of um, start that process a little earlier without doing an undergrad in architecture. Um, and also the minor is a really great way to um, sort of test out the program um, without having to commit to doing the full masters. There's quite a lot of people who do the minor and then decide to go into planning or landscape architecture. So it's a great way to sort of try out a year and also provides a lot of um, sort of insight and content for your master's application portfolio because portfolio is a big part of the application process for both um, the minor and the master's. So um, these projects I show in these pictures were all things I did during the minor that I was then able to use in my master's application. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It was, it was really cool to be able to start my, my master's education so early on. Um, yeah. And so then what is the program like? I, I refer to the program here to encompass both the minor and the masters because they're you know two parts of the same program. Um, so I did my last year of the masters during COVID, which I hope no one listening to this will have to necessarily experience. So I don't include any pictures from online school, but there's a lot of really wonderful site visits. I actually think that's you, Catherine. Um, this was from our studio one when I was in the minor. Um, it's you get to know your cohort really well. And I think that was easily one of my favorite parts of the program was the studio culture, as we call it. Um, and there, you know, you do a lot of socialization and working together and, you know, academic socialization, that is, and um, learning to work as a team, which was a big part to me. And then also learning how to give constructive feedback. So these pictures down here are um, from critiques of projects that we had to physically build. Um, both of these are actually with Mauricio, who is here, Catherine also referred to. So um, that's like sort of the more social side of it. And then in studio, you get to learn from your classmates so, so much. Um, I'd say, I always say I learned just as much from my cohort as I did from my professors, um, which is why also that 
you know, that question of what undergrad should I do? That's such a rich question because you have people from so many different backgrounds that you can, um, that you can learn from. Uh, I remember someone once told me you need like eight different degrees to be fully prepared for an architecture program um, or for a career in architecture. And I think having people around you that have a little bit of each of those backgrounds is just so much more of an enriching way to do it than trying to do it all yourself. Um, so learning to learn from each other, I think, was one of the biggest skills I learned in this program. Um, I was also going to talk a lot about extracurriculars, which Catherine sort of started to bring up in her presentation, so I can talk a little bit more about that. But the Sapple community outside the classroom is also really rich. Um, I had the benefit of being part of several groups outside the classroom. So I was part of the Students Association for three years and then also helped to co-found the Advocates for Equitable Design Education, um, both of which are you know, greater and further opportunities to learn from the people around you. Um, again, all those different backgrounds, but then also the different skills that we all bring to the table. Um, it's a really enriching way to sort of complement your formal education, if you like, um, as well as getting to know the sort of the faculty and staff as well. I think there's a lot of people that you know, go through the program and they get to know their classmates super well, but don't always take full advantage of getting to know the wonderful people that run the faculty. Um, so that was one thing I also really enjoyed through extracurriculars is getting to engage with professors and administration who I might not get to speak to in class. Um, so I would say the biggest thing, the biggest piece of advice I could ever give is take full advantage of everyone around you while you're there because um, everyone has something to teach. So these are a series of questions that I was sort of asking when I was in high school and in undergrad, um, just because, you know, I was so like dead set on this being my end goal that I really needed or I really wanted to fully prepare myself as best as I could, um, as well as a couple of questions I sort of wish I had asked. Um, so what classes should you take in high school? Um, I would say art courses that I took in high school were probably the most useful. If your school has drafting courses, those are super helpful as well. Um, I think a lot of people think there's a lot of math and physics involved in architecture. And depending on what specialization you go into, there can be, but there doesn't have to be. So um, I know several people who have said to me, like, oh, I would love to be an architect, but I suck at math. Like, you don't have to be good at math. So those are less important than many people think. Um, and I, I focused more in your high school courses on what would prep you for undergrad versus architecture. A lot of the stuff you learn in university will be better foundations for architecture than your high school courses. So don't stress too much about it. Um, these were the biggest skills that I found surprising when I came into the program. Um, well, maybe surprising isn't the right word, but um, I, maybe I didn't realize just how much of it there was visual communication is not the same thing as being good at art. Knowing how to convey your ideas with a render or a diagram is something I'm convinced that architects continue to learn for the rest of their lives. Um, and so anything you can do to sort of build that skill will help you in the long run for sure. Um, giving presentations, there are a lot of presentations in the program, um, as well as also in industry. You're constantly presenting and communicating your ideas with both images and words. So do what you can to get comfortable with putting your ideas into words and presenting that to people in an effective and engaging way. Um, I was terrified of public speaking when I was in junior high. And uh, I think a lot of my high school teachers identified that in me and forced me to give presentations. And I hated it at the time, but I'm now super thankful that they did because I would not have gotten through school without building those skills. Um, still makes me nervous, but I can do it now. <laughs> um, and then also writing. Um, I would argue writing is a lot more prevalent through the program than, than math even is. So um, it's not necessarily the same as the writing you would do in an English paper in high school, but um, it's a lot more research-based. So um, one way you can build this is by reading um, about architecture and sort of beginning to learn the vocabulary. We all talk about archi speak being a thing. Um, there are certain vocabulary that you can use that 
really makes what you're trying to say succinct and to the point. And that's always appreciated and is super important for writing effectively. So um, yeah, I'd say that's something that you can, you can always prep for. Um, and then what software do we use? So um, when I came into the program, I knew Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign pretty well. And then I knew SketchUp. SketchUp isn't used in the program quite as much, but you're sort of given the freedom in your studio courses, which are your main design classes, to use whatever software that you are most comfortable with. So if you have like a drafting course in high school that's teaching you SketchUp or sometimes they teach Revit, those are both super helpful um, things to know, but literally any experience you can get with anything that's listed here, um, Rhino is sort of like a much more advanced and better version of SketchUp and Blender is a free modeling and rendering tool. So anything you can learn coming into the program will help you, but it's not necessary to have any background in this. The program is structured that, you know, it can take you from step one through to the end and it's all good. Um, so again, if you, you know, if you're super into history and that's what you want to do your undergrad in, you don't need to feel any pressure to sort of learn anything else or that you're going to be behind. Um, yeah. And then this was a big question I always had. Um, this really depends on what your major is. I would say if you're not doing an art course, art classes are super beneficial, but I'm perhaps just a bit biased in that sense. But um, don't be afraid to take harder electives if you think they'll be useful or interesting. Um, I took I did an art degree and my friends all called me crazy because I took calc as an elective, um, but it, I don't know, it was helpful to an extent, but I also took business law and a sustainability geography course, intro to psychology and Spanish. Um, languages I think are sort of something that you don't really talk about as being helpful, but they often have a super interesting cultural component to them. So I always found they were sort of a nice way to learn about the world because architecture is such like a global cultural um, discipline that is really helpful to have a bit more awareness of other cultures. So um, anything like that is really interesting to bring in. Um, others I looked at taking but didn't end up doing were marketing and communications courses and some history classes. I did take art history courses. Um, art history and architecture history have a lot of overlap, so those are helpful as well. Um, but really just anything you're interested in. As I said before, you're going to be in university for a minimum of six years, so should do what you can to enjoy at least most of it. Um, but one, one thing to note is that if you do the minor, it does take up quite a lot of your electives. So I wouldn't do like all electives in first year because you might end up with some courses you can't use um, further down the line. And then is there anything else I can do? So um, I would say like if you're the best way to learn about architecture is to experience it. So anything you can do to get out in the city and, and learn about anything to do with living in the city, it doesn't have to specifically be buildings as we've already talked about architecture encompasses so much more than just the actual building. Um, and I think the discipline is becoming more and more diverse as we see more classes in fabrication and um, sort of equitable research and all sorts of, you know, things like that. There's a lot of overlap with other disciplines. So anything you can do to sort of experience what's out there. Um, I love the U of C Design Matters series. It's, I also think you learn a lot from hearing experienced people talk about architecture and cities. Um, you absorb a lot more than you might think you do um, just from listening to people talk or reading what other people have to write about it. Um, there are also other organizations in the city such as BEA um, Calgary and Detox, as well as AADE that Catherine mentioned, who put on public events that you can learn. BEA stands for Building Equality in Architecture. Um, I know they've been trying to get a speaker series up and running about um, you know, equality and equity in the profession. And then Detox also, um, like I know they're doing a series right now about the untold city. So going around and getting sort of backstage tours of different buildings and different projects that are happening um, in the city that are sort of significant to us. 
Um, the RAIC is also a good resource for finding things to do. And then sort of architecture adjacent is the Bump Festival, which happens in the summer, but um, it's the Beltline Urban Mural Project. And then events like Beakerhead or Chinook Blast that happened last year that are more sort of installation based, but um, often have a lot of similarities to some of the fabrication projects that Catherine was talking about. So um, if you're interested in that side of things, they're super, super interesting to go to. And I think that was it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, Alexa, can I? Yeah. Thanks, Alana. One little thing about languages, because it is very important. They actually say the people with an uh, English major background and who speak different languages are the ones who, as people who didn't start in art or design, are the ones who succeed most transferring into architecture because of the mental malleability and being able to read things at different scales and it's through different ways. So just a nota bene. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, excellent advice. That, that was all really wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, as Catherine um, uh, described and as we've been discussing, our program is focused on challenge-based learning and we really encourage our students to build, prototype, and collaborate with community and industry partners uh, in the city and beyond. We have five fundamental principles in our professional programs, community-engaged learning, entrepreneurial mindset, future-focused design, research, and social innovation. And our research projects uh, provide advanced skill building opportunities and promote job creation and diversify Calgary's building and construction industry. Students are learning how to create safe neighborhoods with economic prosperity, interactive public green spaces and areas, and accessible transportation. Like um, we've heard, it's more than just buildings. And this is the type of things that you'll learn as these communities are really the foundation for a future that is more environmentally sustainable, socially equitable, and infectious disease resilient. And SAPL has two locations our main campus in Northwest Calgary, as well as our newer downtown space, the City Building Design Lab. Uh, you can experience our, our locations by using our 360 virtual tour on our website, or keep your eyes peeled on our, on our website for our next open house. So before we go into more detail about our programs, I just wanna review some basic terminologies to make sure that we're all on the same page. So a bachelor's degree is sometimes called an undergraduate degree, a major, is the uh, main program or topic of your undergraduate degree um, with a required number of courses. And when you successfully complete all those courses within your major, that's when you're usually eligible to graduate with that degree. A minor is a smaller specialization with a minimum required number of courses that can usually be completed within the number of units required for your bachelor's degree. So that typically means that you won't have to extend your program in order to actually complete a minor as well as your major. Um, minors are not required though, um, so you can choose if you wanna do it or not. And they will offer more insight into the into a different or complementary area to your uh, major. So like Alana was saying, you can kind of try it out before you maybe commit to something later on down the line. A master's or graduate degree requires advanced study beyond a bachelor's degree. So therefore applicants are only eligible to apply once they've actually completed a bachelor's degree. And sometimes uh, graduate programs require a bachelor's degree with a specific topic area for entry. So at SAPL, we offer a minor in architectural studies, as you've heard lots about, um, or an ARST minor. The three professional programs, a Master of Architecture, or the MARC degree, a Master of Planning, or the MPLAN degree, and a Master of Landscape Architecture, or the MLA degree. They're not listed here, but we also have a research-based master's and PhD program in environmental design and a doctor of design as well. In some cases, we also have transfer students who apply to our programs. And in this case, the applicant has taken uh, courses of a specific number at a different post-secondary institution, um, and then they'll apply to UCalgary to complete their degree. So how do you go from high school to design school? 
Um, to become an architect, planner, or landscape architect in Canada, students must complete a professional graduate degree. So therefore, a bachelor or an undergraduate degree must be done first. And we've discussed this, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, what is the best undergraduate degree to take if you're interested in, in pursuing this path? Short answer is anything you're interested in. So like Alana was saying, study what you love. Uh, students will come to SAPL with a variety of different backgrounds. If you like your major, you'll hopefully do well in it and you'll receive higher grades, which are really important when applying for your graduate program. So if you love design, you can consider taking a Bachelor of Design or a Bachelor of Interior Design. But alternatively, if you're interested in arts or science or business, you can take those as well. And it's completely up to you. And like Alana said, you're, you're enriching the cohort of the students that are coming into the program with the knowledge that you have and that you're passionate about. So that's truly what's important. And if you're going to take your undergraduate degree at UCalgary, what program should you consider combining um, together with the minor in architectural studies? And again, it's completely up to you. Uh, we commonly see a lot of applicants in from the Bachelor of Arts in Urban Studies um, or the Bachelor of Fine Arts in Visual Studies doing it. But like we said, if you're in business or science or other art degrees, um, you can also pursue the minor as well. So now I would like to invite Jen Telefer, our academic programs coordinator, to dive a little bit deeper into our SAPL programs. Thanks, Alexa, and hello, everyone. Thank you for your interest in our programs here at SAPL. Um, one thing to note, we don't have an architecture planning or landscape architecture undergraduate program or bachelor's degree or major, um, but we do have a lot of other options. So if you're interested in pursuing our planning or our landscape architecture pathway, you can complete any undergraduate degree, which we've mentioned is similar to architecture. Um, oops. Architecture is a little different because we do have the architectural studies minor. Um, this allows the flexibility of having those two areas of specialization like Alexa mentioned. So students who successfully complete the arts minor and are accepted into the Master of Architecture program at UCalgary are admitted into our two-year master's program. So they've saved that year um, and money. <laughs> they, um, they wouldn't have to complete the foundation year of our master's because the minor courses are the same as our foundation year courses. So the undergrad students are in the same classes as our grad students. If, if you complete a UCalgary degree without the architectural studies minor, that's totally fine. You can apply to our three-year master of architecture program. And again, any discipline is eligible for admission. So for those of you interested in the minor, um, in order to apply, you must be in at least your second year of your bachelor's degree program. So you don't apply directly from high school. Uh, so the first step when you're in high school is thinking about the major, um, the main program that you want to apply to. So we have um, three undergraduate courses that students can take as we get asked that a lot. What can I take in my first year? Um, we have one called ARC 201. That's ARC architecture and the future of cities. And um, we offer it both in the fall and winter and occasionally some years we also offer it in the summer. And then we have two undergraduate studio courses. So we have ARC 406, which is um, design thinking in the built environment studio one and um, ARC 201 is a prerequisite for that. And then in the, that's a fall course. And then in the winter, you can take the second one, which is ARC 408 design thinking studio two. Um, and you have to have taken 406 to get into that one. But these are all good prep courses for your application to the minor. It helps you develop things for your portfolio. Also, you need um, a GPA of 3.2 on your last 10 courses, most recent 10 courses. Um, and you also have to submit two supporting documents. So we ask for a statement of interest, just a short paragraph on your interest in architecture and why you want to be considered to be in the, accepted into the minor of architectural studies. And then the second piece is a small digital portfolio um, we're looking for six pieces of work that demonstrate creative ability or potential. Um, we'd like to think of the portfolio as a visual introduction to your skills and interests. So the application deadline for the minor is always February 1st each year, um, and it's a two-step process. So first, as a UCalgary student, you submit your change of program request in your online student center portal, which you would become familiar with um, if you were, once you were admitted to a bachelor's program. And then the second part is submitting um, one PDF file that combines your portfolio and your statement of interest. So now about the Master of Architecture. Um, this program prepares students for rewarding careers as designers and fulfills the educational requirements for licensure as an architect. Apple is the only accredited architecture school in Alberta. 
The Master of Architecture program delivers design education through core courses, work integrated learning studios, study abroad opportunities, focused research block weeks, and elective courses. So there's two programs. The three-year program is open to applicants from any undergraduate discipline. The program begins with the foundation year to provide students with the knowledge and skill they will need to continue with the MR professional degree. And then we have our two-year program, which is obviously open to students with the University of Calgary minor in architectural studies or an accredited architecture degree, um, undergraduate degree from another school. The Master of Planning is an accredited two-year first professional course-based graduate degree program. Planners shape communities and cities that are responsive to the future's challenges and opportunities. The program is design and studio-based, putting students in real or simulated planning project situations where they must problem solve to determine physical or spatial design policy and land use planning outcomes. So the, the four-year bachelor's degree is required for this one as well. It doesn't have a foundation year. And again, any discipline is eligible to apply to the program. Um, it's recommended to learn some basic design skills as this will help you both with your portfolio that you have to submit when you apply, as well as just your experience during the studio courses. Our Master of Landscape Architecture program is the first professional course-based graduate program. SAPL offers Alberta's only professionally accredited landscape architecture degree as well. Landscape architects provide innovative solutions to environmental and urban challenges. The profession is growing to include a wide range of areas at different scales from residential to regional. So again, with the Master of Landscape Architecture, there's two programs. Um, the three-year program is open to applicants from any undergraduate discipline. The program begins with a foundation year like the AMARC, and um, it also, that prepares you to go on to the two, rest of the two years of the professional degree. And we also have a two-year program, so that's open to students who have a landscape architecture undergrad degree. Awesome. Okay. So in closing, I want to thank everyone for their excellent presentations this evening. Um, if you're interested in learning more about SAPL, our programs, our research projects, or our student work, you can sign up for our newsletters on our website, follow us on social media, or read our news stories. Um, if you're in the process of preparing your application, but you still have questions, please email us or attend one of our Ask SAPL sessions. Um, we can also set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, we have a bunch of recorded sessions from faculty, students, and alumni on our website for portfolio guidance, tips, and application information, but we're still happy to answer any questions and provide support through the application process. Lastly, I want to thank everyone for coming to this session. We hope you enjoyed learning more about SAPL. Um, I know that we did. <laughs> we have arrived at the question and answer period. So as a friendly reminder, if you have a question and you want to ask it live and in real time, you can use the Zoom button to raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask your question. Or if you're unable to say your question verbally, you can send it in the chat and then I'll read it aloud for you. And because we only have a couple minutes and we're waiting for questions to come in, some people sent them in already. So I'll get started with those. The first one is, is it possible to take the minor with an engineering undergraduate degree? And the minor, I guess we're talking about is the one in architectural studies. Yeah, I think the, the engineering programs at the University of Calgary um, are quite restrictive in terms of what you do with your um, electives. So um, to my knowledge, it, it really would end up extending the degree to be a five year total. So it's doable and you can do it, but what the ones we've seen do it usually finish their engineering major and everything in their four years, and then they come and do the minor all together at once in their fifth year. So that's the one that's the, the one degree at U University of Calgary that's a bit restrictive that way. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, and what is included in a good portfolio? So do you have any like basic uh, portfolio suggestions or advice that you'd provide for students as they're preparing? Jen, do you want me? I mean, Alana can also probably answer that. I'd say, as Jen mentioned, um, it is a way to introduce yourself. I, what I would say, one of the mistakes is students assume we're seeing how good architects you already are. And so they make uh, buildings, representation of just buildings, which is not uh, like having one or two things like that of you showcasing how you interpret a building is, is okay, but it's also to introduce people, it will put photography, um, it's showing what you pay attention to and also what you feel is valuable in the world that you then went through your education want to 
uh, too. So even so, um, being some of it could be technical, some of it could be artistic, showing different explorations. Because as we, as you saw from the examples we all show today, it's not doing one thing well repeatedly. It's just uh, it's learning through different things, and then showcasing how you do that. I think would be important. Um, the, the, the way it's presented, attention to detail. I mean, I know people often come and they're not um, design, graphic designers, but uh, as Alana very well said, it's the communication, um, how you present yourself, what you pay attention to, the, the care of the way things are laid out, that things are clean, although then it can start to be stylistic. Some people can be really messy. It's a bit like the way you dress up. Some people come to in jeans and still carry it. So finding that up, you know, expressing your self, it's, it's a way to introduce yourself to us really, uh, to the committee, because there's a committee, there's three, at least three people looking at that to, to put a category. So I don't know if Alana, you have anything else to add from? Yeah, I think like that covers everything that I ever, was told about a portfolio, as well as um, I remember wondering, especially for my minor portfolio, if I should, you know, put together a quick 3D model to show that I can use SketchUp because I, I thought that was really important coming into it, um, which it wasn't, but that's okay. And then um, I remember someone gave me the advice that like, don't just include something to show that you can use a certain software. It should show more than that. It should show, like you were saying, Catherine, like a bit about your personality or your interests. Um, that's going to go a lot further and making an impact. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. We've had a question come into the chat. So what is the relationship between civil engineers and architects in the design process? The relationship between engineers and architects is always an interesting one because, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know civil engineering in particular, um, it depends on the project, um, who's hiring who. Uh, it can be if it's more the attention, each one brings their whatever their, their specialty is. So I don't know if there's something specific about civil engineering. Are you asking about the scale or engineering? Because there's different kind of engineering and they have impact in different areas of the, the design process. Yeah, perhaps if we wait for a clarification, we can move on to the next question. And please feel free to, to put a little bit more context for that question, and we're happy to answer it. Um, we did have another question come in about the urban studies undergrad, um, but thank you, Carly popped in a uh, link there so you can visit the under the uh, actual page for urban studies to learn more about the program. Um, and I think Jen had a question come into her. Yes, it was actually, I have a question for Alana. <clears throat> you mentioned that you did your minor in your third year. Mm -hmm. So I get asked that a lot. Like sometimes students aren't sure if they should try to hold off and do their minor in their, all in their fourth year and then roll into the MRC from there. Did you find it was challenging or did you miss people in your cohort from the minor when you skipped a year kind of thing? Like, how did it work out for you? Um, yeah, I would definitely say there's pros and cons to doing it each way. Um, First of all, I decided to do all of my classes in one year versus doing it over two years. Some people do it sort of half and half between third and fourth year. Um, I decided to do it all in one year because the classes sort of, the architecture classes take up a lot of space in your schedule and doing an art degree, um, it was really difficult to fit art studio classes around architecture studio. So it was just easier to do it all in one year. So that's why I decided to do it that way. And then, I decided to do it in third year partially because I was impatient to start. Um, I wanted to start as soon as I was accepted, um, but I did find that it sort of, um, I really enjoyed being able to bring what I learned in architecture back into my undergrad and my fourth year. So I found like, I think the art I made in fourth year was like way improved because I did the minor in my third year. So that's one thing I'd say is like, 
it opens up a bit more of a conversation between your two degrees if you can sort of yo-yo back and forth. But um, I did miss my cohort, but then I also had the advantage of getting to know two fantastic cohorts. So I don't think that was a problem necessarily. The only thing I'd say is starting sort of master's level courses when I was 19 was a lot. <laughs> um, my first semester, like it was, it was overwhelming because I'm younger than the program's sort of designed for. So being honest with yourself about whether you have sort of the dedication to school and the maturity to do that. Um, like a lot of my classmates were like 30 and I'm 19. So just knowing whether you can sort of interface with that is a good question to ask yourself. I didn't consider before I started the program and I, I still enjoyed it. I don't think I would have done it differently, but um, it's just an interesting thing to consider with doing it that way around. Okay, great. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> great insight. Okay. Sorry yeah. to come back about the, I think you did, is it writing about the civil engineering? I mean, transportation bridges, uh, that it, there is a lot of links, especially at the urban design scale. I think initially we, uh, the infrastructure, there's some very interesting work in how intra infrastructure and architecture can integrate and uh, be double used rather than here's a bridge, here's a road, here's a building. And as building, as the uh, as uh, cities get denser and denser, that's definitely a, a, a strong area. We do also have uh, at least three uh, professors that have an engineering background, but not civil engineering. I'm thinking of Geta Chu, who's, uh, who works more in the uh, focuses on sustainability assessment and, and, and then the technical systems. We have Caroline Hashim Vermet. So if you go to the, to the SAPL webpage, looking at the background of the professors, that's another area to see the different uh, degrees that they have. Great. Thank you so much um, for that. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Catherine. Um, we did have one other question that came into the chat and I just wanna make sure that we get to it because we also got it um, for, from the people who registered. So what is it like to be a student? We have a lot of our questions come about, is architecture very demanding? What is the course mode like? How is it different than other programs? So um, does, does anyone wanna talk about like the you know day in the life of a SAPL student type of situation. Alana, um, yeah, <laughs> I can. Um, it, it is demanding. Um, I don't think it helps anyone to sort of downplay that. But I would also say that um, you get what you put into it. Like I think as much as it's very rigorous, you will be rewarded for working hard, like every time. So. Um, I don't think, you know, yeah, it is, it is demanding, but I don't think anyone would say it's unfair most, at least most of the time. Like it's, yeah, like it, you get what you put into it. I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing I could say on that. I would, if I can add, I think what's important, it's the demand is also not that you're asked always to do too much. It's a bit the mm -hmm. open-endedness. Is a studio is scheduled for four afternoons, two to six, but we generally have contact time, only two of those, but it's because you learn through failing. I mean, a lot of design, it's like art, a lot of the more open-ended things so that it's not, here's a formula. We can say we need three drawings from you by uh, for next week. And you will sit and explore and read, uh, redraw, try different things because there isn't a very um, clear solution. Like with the technical courses there is, but with design, even in the profession, it's really the, the schedule, the, the, the money from the client, the, the deadline that makes people stop because it's an, that's where the exploration happens. And that's part of the beauty of it. There is a myth that you have to go through and you don't sleep. And I don't know, I've, I went through, I, I mean, that's a personal thing. Um, it's how people work through things. It is demanding. Uh, but it's also quite inspiring. So I think that that it's not just the course load that makes it, uh, that demands of your time. It's the kind of thinking is, because you think of one thing, you think you have it. And then the question comes, it's like, well, did you think of structures? You think of the structures then, well, what about uh, the universal design and accessibility? So there's always more. I think the biggest thing is the difficulty is in school, you're working often 
sometimes in small groups, but often alone. And as I said at the beginning is architecture is a team sport. So that's where I think there's a big gap. And there's discussion about architectural education and whether that is appropriate. So. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. I wanna thank all of you for coming, for your attentiveness and for your questions. I wanna thank um, the team at UFC for organizing and helping us with this session and hosting. I wanna thank our presenters uh, tonight, uh, Alana, Catherine, Jen, Jen um, thank you so much. And um, hopefully if you have any questions, you'll, you'll email us and we'll be hearing from you. Please keep in touch and thank you everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having us.